Chapter 10 Elizabeth woke with a start and reached for her bedside sword with no want of haste. She sprang to her feet with the grace and silence of a panther and held her blade at the ready, examining the room for the slightest movement. She knew not the hour, but the sun had yet to rise, and she knew that danger was quite near, though the cause remained inexact. Elizabeth had fallen asleep next to her ailing sister, who continued to slumber undisturbed. Stupid, stupid girl, she thought, lowering your guard in an unfamiliar house. Oh, that Master Lior had disciplined you more severely. An assortment of dastardly schemes raced through Elizabeth's mind as she waited for an attack. Perhaps Mr. Darcy meant to slit her throat for some perceived slight, or because she threatened his own standing as a warrior. Perhaps Miss Bingley meant to smother Jane, judging her an unworthy recipient of her brother's affections. It was soon evident, however, that she and Jane were quite alone in the room, and Elizabeth felt at once ashamed and foolish for thinking such outrageous things possible. There was presently a noise, a faint grunt of exertion, which drew Elizabeth's attention away from her thoughts and towards the windows that overlooked Netherfield's south gardens. There her eyes were met with a most extraordinary and unexpected sight. Mr. Darcy stood alone on the lawn, holding a katana sword and wearing hardly a thread of clothing save for his white sleeping trousers. His feet were bare, his chest uncovered, and his chestnut mane looked all the more radiant in the light of the full moon. There were no unmentionables to strike down, no ninjas crawling about the estate. Mr. Darcy was merely sparring with himself in the garden. Elizabeth watched him wield his blade with stunning grace and speed, marvelling at the precision of his form as he carried out each movement. It was a fighting style she had rarely seen employed, Japanese in origin, and known to be among the most difficult to master. Dragon's tongue, she thought, the finest showing I have ever observed. Elizabeth knew that it was rude to watch a warrior spar alone. She herself had been the subject of many an unwanted gaze whilst practising her technique, and had taken her share of ears from the offenders. Yet she was strangely powerless to avert her eyes. What would Jane say were she to wake and find me in this fashion? She thought, oh, the lecture. I would rather my ears be taken than suffer it. As her thoughts were thus employed, Mr. Darcy's attention suddenly turned to Elizabeth's window. Their eyes might have met, had Lizzie not retreated with the quickness she usually reserved for battle. She stood perfectly still, her back against the curtains, hoping fervently that Darcy had not seen her. Elizabeth slept no more that night. The rest of the day passed uneventfully, save for an unfortunate incident involving a washwoman and a pair of carriage horses that deserves no elaboration here. That evening, Elizabeth joined the party in the drawing room. The card table, however, did not appear. Mr. Darcy was writing, and Miss Bingley, seated near him, was watching the progress of his letter and repeatedly calling off his attention by messages to his sister. Mr. Hurst and Mr. Bingley were at piquet, and Mrs. Hurst was observing their game. Elizabeth took up the oiling of her musket stock and was sufficiently amused in attending to what passed between Darcy and his companion. How delighted Miss Darcy will be to receive such a letter. He made no answer. You write uncommonly fast. And you prattle uncommonly much. How many letters you must have occasion to write in the course of a year. Letters of business, too. How odious I should think them. And how odious, indeed, that I should so often suffer to write them in your company. Pray tell your sister that I long to see her. I have already told her so once, by your desire. How can you contrive to write so even? He was silent. Tell your sister I am delighted to hear of her improvement on the harp, and pray let her know that I am quite in raptures with her beautiful little design for a table. Miss Bingley, the groans of a hundred unmentionables would be more pleasing to my ears than one more word from your mouth. Were you not otherwise agreeable, I should be forced to remove your tongue with my sabre. Oh, it is of no consequence. I shall see her in January. But do you always write such charming long letters to her, Mr. Darcy? They are generally long, but whether always charming, it is not for me to determine. It is a rule with me that a person who can write a long letter with ease cannot write ill. 
that will not do for a compliment to Darcy, Caroline, cried her brother, because he does not write with ease. He studies too much for words of four syllables, do you not, Darcy? Mr. Darcy continued to work on his letter in silence, though Elizabeth perceived him to be a great deal annoyed with his friends. When that business was over, Mr. Darcy applied to Miss Bingley and Elizabeth for an indulgence of some music. Miss Bingley moved with some alacrity to the pianoforte, and after a polite request that Elizabeth would lead the way, she seated herself. Mrs. Hurst sang with her sister as Elizabeth played. When once the earth was still and dead were silent, and London town was for but living men, came the plague upon us swift and violent, and so our dearest England we defeated. While they were thus employed, Elizabeth could not help observing how frequently Mr. Darcy's eyes were fixed on her. She hardly knew how to suppose that she could be an object of admiration to so great a man, and yet that he should look at her because he disliked her was still more strange. She could only imagine, however, that she drew his notice because there was something more wrong and reprehensible, according to his ideas of right, than in any other person present. The supposition did not pain her. She liked him too little to care for his approbation. Miss Bingley played next, varying the charm by a lively Scotch air, and soon afterwards Mr. Darcy, drawing near to Elizabeth, said to her, do you not feel a great inclination, Miss Bennet, to seize such an opportunity of dancing a reel? She smiled, but made no answer. He repeated the question with some surprise at her silence. Oh, said she, I heard you before, but I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say, yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste— but I always delight in overthrowing those kind of schemes and cheating a person of their premeditated contempt. I have therefore made up my mind to tell you that I do not want to dance a reel at all, and now despise me if you dare. Indeed, I do not dare. Elizabeth, having rather expected to affront him, was amazed at his gallantry, and Darcy had never been so bewitched by any woman as he was by her. He really believed that were it not for the inferiority of her connections, he should be in some danger of falling in love, and were it not for his considerable skill in the deadly arts, that he should be in danger of being bested by hers, for never had he seen a lady more gifted in the ways of vanquishing the undead. Miss Bingley saw, or suspected enough, to be jealous— and her great anxiety for the recovery of her dear friend Jane received some assistance from her desire of getting rid of Elizabeth. She often tried to provoke Darcy into disliking her guest by talking of their supposed marriage and planning his happiness in such an alliance. I hope, said she as they were walking together in the shrubbery the next day, you will give your mother-in-law a few hints when this desirable event takes place as to the advantage of holding her tongue. And, if you can compass it, do cure the younger girls of running after officers, and, if I may mention so delicate a subject, endeavour to check Miss Bennet's unladylike affinity for guns and swords and exercise and all those silly things best left to men or ladies of low breeding. Have you anything else to propose for my domestic felicity? At that moment they were met from another walk by Mrs. Hurst and Elizabeth herself. I did not know that you intended to walk said Miss Bingley, in some confusion, lest she had been overheard. "'You used us abominably ill,' answered Mrs. Hurst, "'running away without telling us you were coming out.' Then, taking the disengaged arm of Mr. Darcy, she left Elizabeth to walk by herself. The path just admitted three. Mr. Darcy felt their rudeness and immediately said, "'This walk is not wide enough for our party. We had better go into the avenue.' But Elizabeth, who had not the least inclination to remain with them, laughingly answered, No, no, stay where you are. You are charmingly grouped and appear to uncommon advantage. The picturesque would be spoilt by admitting a fourth. 
Besides, that path is most assuredly rife with zombies, and I have not the inclination to engage in fighting them off today. Goodbye. She then ran gaily off, rejoicing as she rambled about, in the hope of being at home again in a day or two. Jane was already so much recovered as to intend leaving her room for a couple of hours that evening. Chapter 11 when the ladies removed after dinner, Elizabeth ran up to her sister, and seeing her well, attended her into the drawing-room, where she was welcomed by Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst with many professions of pleasure. Elizabeth had never seen them so agreeable as they were during the hour which passed before the gentlemen appeared. Despite their lack of fighting skill, she had to admit that their powers of conversation were considerable— if only words were capable of beheading a zombie, she thought, I would presently find myself in the company of the world's two greatest warriors. But when the gentleman entered, Miss Bingley's eyes were instantly turned toward Darcy, and she had something to say to him before he had advanced many steps. He addressed himself to Jane with a polite congratulation. Mr. Hurst also made her a slight bow, and said he was very glad indeed it had been but a cold and not the strange plague. But the greatest warmth remained for Bingley's salutation. He was full of joy and attention. The first half hour was spent in piling up the fire, lest she should suffer from the change of room. He then sat down by her and talked scarcely to anyone else. Elizabeth took to the small grinding wheel in the corner of the room and watched it all with great delight whilst sharpening the gentleman's swords, which she had found embarrassingly dull upon examination. When tea was over, Mr. Hurst reminded his sister-in-law of the card table, but in vain. She had obtained private intelligence that Mr. Darcy did not wish for cards, and Mr. Hurst soon found even his open petition rejected. She assured him that no one intended to play, and the silence of the whole party on the subject seemed to justify her. Mr. Hurst had therefore nothing to do but to stretch himself on one of the sofas and go to sleep. Darcy took up a book, Miss Bingley did the same, and Mrs. Hurst, principally occupied in playing with one of Elizabeth's throwing stars, joined now and then in her brother's conversation with Miss Bennet. Miss Bingley's attention was quite as much engaged in watching Mr. Darcy's progress through his book as in reading her own, and she was perpetually either making some inquiry or looking at his page. She could not win him, however, to any conversation. He merely answered her question and read on. At length, quite exhausted by the attempt to be amused with her own book, which she had only chosen because it was the second volume of his, she gave a great yawn and said— how pleasant it is to spend an evening in this way. I declare, after all, there is no enjoyment like reading. Spoken like one who has never known the ecstasy of holding a still-beating heart in her hand, said Darcy. Miss Bingley, who was quite used to having her lack of combat training impugned, made no reply. She then yawned again, threw aside her book, and cast her eyes round the room in quest for some amusement— when hearing her brother mentioning a ball to Miss Bennet, she turned suddenly towards him and said, "'By the by, Charles, are you really serious in meditating a dance at Netherfield? I would advise you to consult the wishes of the present party. I am much mistaken if there are not some among us to whom a ball would be rather a punishment than a pleasure.' "'If you mean Darcy,' cried her brother, "'he may go to bed if he chooses before it begins. But as for the ball, it is quite a settled thing.' and as soon as the ground has sufficiently hardened and the present increase in unmentionables has passed, I shall send round my cards. I should like balls infinitely better, she replied, if they were carried on in a different manner. You should like balls infinitely better, said Darcy, if you knew the first thing about them. Elizabeth blushed and suppressed a smile, slightly shocked by his flirtation with impropriety and slightly impressed that he should endeavour to flirt with it at all. Miss Bingley, ignorant of his meaning, made no answer, and soon afterwards she got up and walked about the room. Her figure was elegant, and she walked well, but Darcy, at whom it was all aimed, was still inflexibly studious. In the desperation of her feelings, she resolved on one effort more, and turning to Elizabeth, said, "'Miss Eliza Bennet, let me persuade you to follow my example and take a turn about the room.' 
I assure you it is very refreshing after sitting so long in one attitude. Elizabeth needed no such refreshment. She had once been ordered to maintain a handstand for six days in the blistering Beijing sun, but agreed to it immediately. Miss Bingley succeeded no less in the real object of her civility. Mr. Darcy looked up and unconsciously closed his book. He was directly invited to join their party, but he declined it, observing that he could imagine but two motives for their choosing to walk up and down the room together, either of which his joining them would upset. What could he mean? She was dying to know what could be his meaning, and asked Elizabeth whether she could at all understand him. Not at all, was her answer, but depend upon it, he means to be severe on us, and our surest way of disappointing him will be to ask nothing about it. Miss Bingley, however, was incapable of such self-discipline, and persevered, therefore, in requiring an explanation of his two motives. I have not the smallest objection to explaining them, said he. You either choose this method of passing the evening because you are incapable of sitting quietly, or because you are conscious that your figures appear to the greatest advantage in walking. If the first, you are but silly girls undeserving of my attention, and if the second, I can admire you much better from here. In fact, the glow of the fire casts quite a revealing silhouette against the fabric of your gowns. Oh, shocking, cried Miss Bingley, stepping away from the fireplace. I never heard anything so abominable. How shall we punish him for such a speech? I have several ideas on the subject, said Elizabeth, but I'm afraid none would meet with the approval of the present party. Have you no insight into his weaknesses, you and he being so intimately acquainted? Upon my honour, I do not. I do assure you that my intimacy has not yet taught me that. Mr. Darcy possesses calmness of manner, presence of mind, and bravery in battle. Yes, but does he not also possess vanity and pride? Yes, vanity is a weakness indeed, said Miss Bingley, but pride, where there is a real superiority of mind, pride will always be under good regulation. Elizabeth turned away to hide a smile. Your examination of Mr. Darcy is over, I presume, said Miss Bingley, and pray, what is the result? I am perfectly convinced by it that Mr. Darcy has no defect. No, said Darcy, I have faults enough, but they are not, I hope, of understanding. My temper I dare not vouch for. I have taken many a life for offences which would seem but trifles to other men. That is a failing indeed, cried Elizabeth. But you have chosen your fault well, for it is one which I share. I too live by the warrior code, and would gladly kill if my honour demanded it. You are safe from me. There is, I believe, in every disposition a tendency to some particular evil, a natural defect which not even the best education can overcome. And your defect, Mr. Darcy, is to hate everybody. And yours, he replied with a smile, is willfully to misunderstand them. Do let us have a little music, cried Miss Bingley, tired of a conversation in which she had no share. Louisa, you will not mind my waking, Mr. Hurst. Her sister had not the smallest objection, and the pianoforte was opened, and Darcy was not sorry for it. He began to feel the danger of paying Elizabeth too much attention. Chapter 12 In consequence of an agreement between the sisters, Elizabeth wrote the next morning to their mother to beg that the carriage might be sent for them in the course of the day. But Mrs. Bennet, who had calculated on her daughter's remaining at Netherfield till the following Tuesday, which would exactly finish Jane's week, could not bring herself to receive them with pleasure before. Her answer, therefore, was disappointing. Mrs. Bennet sent them word that they could not possibly have the carriage before Tuesday, for it had been badly damaged by errant musket balls during a skirmish between soldiers and a party of the sorry stricken near the encampment at Meryton. This was at least partially true, for the carriage had indeed been caught in a crossfire when Catherine and Lydia used it to visit with a group of officers, but the damage was in fact less severe than Mrs. Bennet suggested. In her postscript, it was added that if Mr. Bingley and his sister pressed them to stay longer, she could spare them.
Against staying longer, however, Elizabeth urged Jane to borrow Mr. Bingley's carriage immediately, and at length it was settled that their original design in leaving Netherfield that morning should be mentioned and the request made. The request excited many professions of concern, and enough was said of wishing them to stay at least till the following day to allow the ground to further harden, and till the morrow their going was deferred. Miss Bingley was then sorry that she had proposed the delay, for her jealousy and dislike of Elizabeth much exceeded her affection for Jane. Mr. Bingley heard with real sorrow that they were to go so soon, and repeatedly tried to persuade Miss Bennet that it would not be safe for her, that she was not enough recovered to fight if the carriage should meet with trouble. But Jane reminded him that Elizabeth was as capable a bodyguard as there was in all of England. To Mr. Darcy it was welcome intelligence. Elizabeth had been at Netherfield long enough. She attracted him more than he liked, and Miss Bingley was uncivil to her and more teasing than usual to himself. He resolved that no sign of admiration should now escape him. Steady to his purpose, he scarcely spoke ten words to her through the whole of Saturday, and though they were at one time left by themselves for half an hour, he adhered most conscientiously to his book and would not even look at her. On Sunday, after morning service, the separation took place. Miss Bingley's civility to Elizabeth increased at last very rapidly, as well as her affection for Jane, and when they parted, after assuring the latter of the pleasure it would always give her to see her either at Longbourn or Netherfield, and embracing her most tenderly, she even shook hands with the former. Elizabeth took leave of the whole party in the liveliest of spirits. The ride to Longbourn was altogether agreeable, save for a brief encounter with a small herd of zombie children, no doubt from Mrs. Beechman's home for orphans, which had recently fallen along with the entire parish of St. Thomas. Mr. Bingley's coachman could not help but vomit down the front of his cravat at the sight of the tiny devils grazing on sun-hardened corpses in a nearby field. Elizabeth kept her musket close, lest they advance, but luck was on their side, and the cursed children took no notice of the carriage. They were not welcomed home very cordially by their mother. Mrs. Bennet thought them very wrong to give so much trouble, and was sure Jane would have caught cold again. Her protests were inflamed by the sight of vomit on the coachman's cravat, a sure sign that they had encountered unmentionables en route. But their father was truly glad to see them, for the evening sparring sessions had lost much of their animation by the absence of Jane and Elizabeth. They found Mary, as usual, deep in the study of human nature. Catherine and Lydia had information for them of a different sort. Much had been done and much had been said in the regiment since the preceding Wednesday. Several of the officers had dined lately with their uncle, a private had been flogged for engaging in base acts with a headless corpse, and it had actually been hinted that Colonel Foster was going to be married. Chapter 13 I hope, my dear, said Mr. Bennet to his wife as they were at breakfast the next morning, that you have ordered a good dinner today, because I have reason to expect an addition to our family party. Who do you mean, my dear? I know of nobody that is coming, I am sure, unless Charlotte Lucas should happen to call in, and I am sure my dinners are good enough for her, since she is an unmarried woman of seven and twenty, and as such should expect little more than a crust of bread washed down with a cup of loneliness. The person of whom I speak is a gentleman and a stranger. Mrs. Bennet's eyes sparkled. A gentleman and a stranger? It is Mr. Bingley, I am sure. I shall be extremely glad to see Mr. Bingley. But, good Lord, how unlucky. There is not a bit of fish to be got today. Lydia, my love, ring the bell. I must speak to Hill this moment. It is not Mr. Bingley, you senseless old cur, said her husband. It is a person whom I never saw in the whole course of my life. After amusing himself some time with their curiosity, he thus explained... About a month ago, I received this letter, and about a fortnight ago, I answered it. It is from my cousin, Mr. Collins, who, when I am dead, may turn you all out of this house as soon as he pleases. Oh, my dear, cried his wife, pray do not talk of that odious man. 
I do think it is the hardest thing in the world that your estate should be entailed away from your own children. Jane and Elizabeth tried to explain that all five of them were capable of fending for themselves, that they could make tolerable fortunes as bodyguards, assassins, or mercenaries, if need be, but it was a subject on which Mrs. Bennet was beyond the reach of reason, and she continued to rail bitterly against the cruelty of settling in a state away from a family of five daughters in favour of a man whom nobody cared anything about. "'It certainly is a most iniquitous affair,' said Mr. Bennet, "'and nothing can clear Mr. Collins from the guilt of inheriting Longbourn. But if you will listen to his letter, you may perhaps be a little softened by his manner of expressing himself.' Hunsford, near Westerham, Kent, 15th October. Dear Sir, The disagreement subsisting between yourself and my late honoured father always gave me much uneasiness. He was a great warrior, as you once were, and I know he looked with fondness upon the days when both of you fought side by side, back when the strange plague was but an isolated inconvenience. Since his passing, I have frequently wished to heal the breach, but for some time I was kept back by my own doubts, fearing lest it might seem disrespectful to his memory for me to be on good terms with anyone with whom my father had once vowed to castrate. My mind, however, is now made up on the subject, for having entered the priesthood, I have been so fortunate as to be distinguished by the patronage of the Right Honourable Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Heavens, cried Elizabeth, he works for Lady Catherine. Let me finish, said Mr. Bennet sternly, whose skill with blade and musket are unmatched, and who has slain more unmentionables than any woman known. As a clergyman, I feel it my duty to promote and establish the blessing of peace in all families. If you should have no objection to receive me into your house, I propose myself the satisfaction of waiting on you and your family Monday, November 18th, by four o'clock, and shall probably trespass on your hospitality till the Saturday following. I remain, dear sir, with respectful compliments to your lady and daughters, your well-wisher and friend, William Collins. At four o'clock, therefore, we may expect this peacemaking gentleman said Mr. Bennet, as he folded up the letter. He seems to be a most conscientious and polite young man, and I doubt not will prove a valuable acquaintance, especially in light of his association with Lady Catherine. Mr. Collins was punctual to his time, and was received with great politeness by the whole family. Mr. Bennet, indeed, said little, but the ladies were ready enough to talk, and Mr. Collins seemed neither in need of encouragement nor inclined to be silent himself. He was a short, fat young man of five-and-twenty. His air was grave and stately, and his manners were very formal. He had not been long seated before he complimented Mrs. Bennet on having so fine a family of daughters, said he had heard much of their beauty, but that in this instance fame had fallen short of the truth, and added that he could hardly wait to see a display of their legendary fighting skill. You are very kind, I am sure, but I should rather see them with husbands than muskets, for else they will be destitute enough. Things are settled so oddly. You allude, perhaps, to the entail of this estate? Ah, sir, I do indeed. It is a grievous affair to my poor girls, you must confess. I am very sensible, madam, of the hardship to my fair cousins, and could say much on the subject, but that I am cautious of appearing forward and precipitate. But I can assure the young ladies that I come prepared to admire them. At present, I will not say more, but perhaps when we are better acquainted. He was interrupted by a summons to dinner, and the girls smiled on each other. They were not the only objects of Mr. Collins's admiration. The hall, the dining room, and all its furniture were examined and praised, and his commendation of everything would have touched Mrs. Bennet's heart but for the mortifying supposition of his viewing it all as his own future property. The dinner, too, was highly admired, and he begged to know to which of his fair cousins the excellency of its cookery was owing. Briefly forgetting her manners, Mary grabbed her fork and leapt from her chair onto the table— Lydia, who was seated nearest her, grabbed her ankle before she could dive at Mr. Collins and presumably stab him about the head and neck for such an insult.
Jane and Elizabeth turned away so Mr. Collins would not see them laughing. He was set right by Mrs. Bennet, who assured him with some asperity that they were very well able to keep a good cook and that her daughters were too busy training to be bothered with the kitchen. He begged pardon for having displeased Mary. In a softened tone, she declared herself not at all offended, but he continued to apologize for about a quarter of an hour. Chapter 14 During dinner, Mr. Bennet scarcely spoke at all, but when the servants were withdrawn, he thought it time to have some conversation with his guest, and therefore started a subject in which he expected him to shine, by observing that he seemed very fortunate in his patroness. Lady Catherine de Bourg was not only one of the king's richest servants, but also one of his deadliest. Mr. Bennet could not have chosen better. Mr. Collins was eloquent in her praise, offering that he had never in his life witnessed such self-discipline in a person of rank. Lady Catherine was reckoned proud by many people he knew, but he had never seen anything but a singular dedication to the art of killing zombies. She had always spoken to him as she would to any other gentleman. She made not the smallest objection to his watching her spa, nor to his leaving the parish occasionally for a week or two to visit his relations. She had even advised him to marry as soon as he could, provided he chose with discretion. I have oft dreamt of watching Lady Catherine's spa, said Elizabeth. Does she live near you, sir? The garden in which stands my humble abode is separated only by a lane from Rosings Park, her ladyship's residence. I think you said she was a widow, sir. Has she any family? She has only one daughter, the heiress of Rosings, and a very extensive property. Ah, said Mrs. Bennet, shaking her head, then she is better off than many girls. And what sort of young lady is she? Is she handsome? She is a most charming young lady indeed. Lady Catherine herself says that, in point of true beauty, Miss de Burgh's is far superior to the handsomest of her sex, because there is that in her features which marks the young lady of distinguished birth. She is unfortunately of a sickly constitution, which has prevented her from following her mother's example in regards to the deadly arts. I fear can she hardly lift a sabre, let alone wield one with such skill as her ladyship. Has she been presented? I do not remember her name among the ladies at court. Her indifferent state of health unhappily prevents her being in town, and by that means, as I told Lady Catherine one day, has deprived the British court of its brightest ornament. <laughs> You may imagine that I am happy to offer these little delicate compliments, which are always acceptable to ladies. You judge very properly, said Mr. Bennet. May I ask whether these pleasing attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment, or are the result of previous study? They arise chiefly from what is passing at the time, and though I sometimes amuse myself with suggesting and arranging such little elegant compliments as may be adapted to ordinary occasions, I always wish to give them as unstudied an air as possible. Mr. Bennet's expectations were fully answered. His cousin was as absurd as he had hoped, and he listened to him with the keenest enjoyment, maintaining at the same time the most resolute composure of countenance. When tea was over, Mr. Bennet was glad to invite him to read aloud to the ladies. Mr. Collins readily assented, and a book was produced, but on beholding it, for everything announced it to be from a circulating library, he started back, and, begging pardon, protested that he never read novels. Kitty stared at him, and Lydia exclaimed. Other books were produced, and after some deliberation he chose four dice's sermons, Lydia gaped as he opened the volume, and before he had, with very monotonous solemnity, read three pages, she interrupted him with, Do you know, Mamma, that my Uncle Phillips talks of an additional battalion coming to join Colonel Foster's? My aunt told me so herself on Saturday. I shall walk to Meryton tomorrow to hear more about it, assuming one of my sisters is willing to join me. Lydia was bid by her two eldest sisters to hold her tongue, but Mr. Collins, much offended, laid aside his book and said, I have often observed how little young ladies are uninterested by books of a serious stamp. I will no longer importune my young cousin. 
Then, turning to Mr. Bennet, he offered himself as his antagonist at backgammon. Mr. Bennet accepted the challenge, observing that he acted wisely in leaving the girls to their own trifling amusements. Mrs. Bennet and her daughters apologised for Lydia's interruption, which, claimed Mrs. Bennet, would have earned her ten wet bamboo lashes had she still been under the tutelage of Master Liu. They promised that it should not occur again if he would resume his book, but Mr. Collins, after assuring them that he bore his young cousin no ill will and should never resent her behaviour as any affront, seated himself at another table with Mr. Bennet and prepared for backgammon. Chapter 15 Mr. Collins was not a sensible man, and the deficiency of nature had been but little assisted by education or society, the greatest part of his life having been spent under the guidance of a brave but illiterate father, and though he belonged to one of the universities, he had oft borne the condemnation of his peers for a perceived lack of bloodlust. The subjection in which his father had brought him up had given him much knowledge of the art of combat, but it was a good deal counteracted by his weak head, fleshy figure, and now the ease of his current patronage. A fortunate chance had recommended him to Lady Catherine de Bourgh, who had been forced to behead her previous rector when he succumbed to the walking death. Having now a good house and a very sufficient income, he intended to marry, and in seeking a reconciliation with the Longbourn family, he had a wife in view, as he meant to choose one of the daughters, if he found them as handsome and amiable as they were represented by common report. This was his plan of amends, of atonement, for inheriting their father's estate, and he thought it an excellent one, full of eligibility and suitableness, and excessively generous on his own part. His plan did not vary on seeing them, the eldest daughter's lovely face and striking muscle tone confirmed his views, and for the first evening she was his settled choice. The next morning, however, made an alteration, for in a quarter of an hour's tete-a-tete -tete with Mrs. Bennet before breakfast, a conversation beginning with his parsonage house and leading naturally to the avowal of his hopes that a mistress might be found for it at Longbourn, produced from her, amid very complacent smiles and general encouragement, a caution against the very Jane he had fixed on. As to her younger daughters, she could not take upon her to say, she could not positively answer, but she did not know of any prepossession, her eldest daughter, she must just mention, she felt it incumbent on her to hint, was likely to be very soon engaged. Elizabeth, equally next to Jane in birth and beauty, and perhaps surpassing her in skill, succeeded her, of course. Mrs. Bennet treasured up the hint, and trusted that she might soon have two daughters married, and the man whom she could not bear to speak of the day before was now high in her good graces. Lydia's intention of walking to Meryton was not forgotten. Every sister, except Mary, agreed to go with her, determined that she survive the trip. Mr. Collins was to attend them, at the request of Mr. Bennet, who was most anxious to get rid of him and have his library to himself. Mr. Collins used the walk to Meryton to his advantage, spending most of it at the side of Elizabeth, who was watching the surrounding woods, prepared to meet the first sign of trouble with her brown bess. Jane and the others followed behind, their muskets also thus engaged. Mr. Collins, who fancied himself a man of peace, carried neither barrel nor blade. He happily puffed away on his ivory and chestnut pipe. A gift from her ladyship, he boasted at every opportunity. They were scarcely a quarter of a mile past the old croquet grounds when Elizabeth first caught the scent of death. Seeing her body tense, the other girls raised their muskets and closed ranks, ready to meet an attack from any direction. Is... is there some sort of trouble? asked Mr. Collins, who suddenly looked as if he might faint. Elizabeth pressed a finger to her lips and motioned for her sisters to follow. She led them along a set of carriage tracks, her footsteps so light as to leave even the smallest grain of sand undisturbed. The tracks continued for a few yards before suddenly veering toward the woods, where broken branches signaled the very spot it had left its wheels and plummeted into the ravine that paralleled one side of the road. Elizabeth peered over the side, 
Some twenty yards below, eight or nine blood-soaked zombies crawled over a shattered wagon and its leaking barrels. Most of them were busy picking at the innards of the carriage horse, but one happy dreadful was scooping the last morsels from the broken skull of the driver, a young girl the sisters recognized at once. Good heavens, whispered Jane. Penny McGregor, oh poor miserable girl, how often we warned her not to ride alone. Penny McGregor had delivered lamp oil to Longbourn and most of the estates within thirty miles of Meryton, since she was scarcely old enough to talk. The McGregors owned a modest home not far from town, where they daily received cartfuls of whale blubber and processed it into lamp oil and fine perfumes. The smell was unbearable, especially during summer, but their goods were desperately needed, and the McGregors were known to be among the most pleasant people in all of Hertfordshire. "'God have mercy on that wretched girl,' said Mr. Collins, who had joined them. "'Can't we just be on our way?' asked Lydia. "'There's no helping her now. Besides, think of how dirty our dresses will get if we have to fight in that awful ravine.' As Jane expressed her shock at such a sentiment, and Kitty argued in favour of it, Elizabeth took the pipe from Mr. Collins's mouth, blew on the glowing tobacco, and threw it over the side. That was a gift from her ladyship, he cried, loud enough to draw the attention of the zombies below. They looked up and let loose their terrible roars, which were cut short by a violent, fiery explosion as pipe and oil met. Suddenly engulfed, the zombies staggered about, flailing wildly and screaming as they cooked. Jane raised her brown bess, but Elizabeth pushed the barrel aside. Let them burn, she said. Let them have a taste of eternity. Turning to her cousin, who had averted his eyes, she added, You see, Mr. Collins, God has no mercy, and neither must we. Though angered by her blasphemy, he thought better of saying anything on the matter, for he saw in Elizabeth's eyes a kind of darkness, a kind of absence, as if her soul had taken leave so that compassion and warmth could not interfere. Upon entering Meryton, after stopping at the MacGregors to deliver the unhappy news, the eyes of the younger ones were immediately wandering up the street in quest of the officers, and nothing less than a very smart bonnet indeed, or the wail of the undead, could recall them. But the attention of every lady was soon caught by a young man whom they had never seen before, of most gentlemanlike appearance, walking with another officer on the other side of the way. The officer, Mr. Denny, was known to Lydia, and he bowed as they passed. All were struck with the stranger's air, and all wondered who he could be, and Kitty and Lydia, determined to find out, led the way across the street, under pretense of wanting something in an opposite shop, and fortunately had just gained the pavement when the two gentlemen, turning back, had reached the same spot. Mr. Denny addressed them directly, and entreated permission to introduce his friend, Mr. Wickham, who had returned with him the day before from town, and he was happy to say had accepted a commission in their corps. This was exactly as it should be, for the young man wanted only regimentals to make him completely charming. His appearance was greatly in his favour. He had all the best part of beauty, a fine countenance, a good figure, and very pleasing address. The introduction was followed up on his side by a happy readiness of conversation, a readiness at the same time perfectly correct and unassuming, and the whole party were still standing and talking together very agreeably when the sound of horses drew their notice, and Darcy and Bingley were seen riding down the street. On distinguishing the ladies of the group, the two gentlemen came directly towards them and began the usual civilities. Bingley was the principal spokesman, and Jane Bennet the principal object. He was then, he said, on his way to Longbourn on purpose to inquire after her. Mr. Darcy corroborated it with a bow, and was beginning to determine not to fix his eyes on Elizabeth, when they were suddenly arrested by the sight of the stranger. Elizabeth happened to see the countenance of both as they looked at each other, so slight as to escape all but her highly trained eye. Both changed colour. One looked white, the other red. Mr. Wickham, after a few moments, touched his hat. A salutation which Mr. Darcy just deigned to return.
Elizabeth could tell by the minuscule twitches of Darcy's sword hand that he had briefly flirted with the notion of drawing his blade. What could be the meaning of it? In another minute, Mr. Bingley, without seeming to have noticed what passed, took leave and rode on with his friend. Mr. Denny and Mr. Wickham walked with the young ladies to the door of Mr. Phillips' house, and then made their bows, in spite of Miss Lydia's pressing entreaties that they should come in, and even in spite of Mrs. Phillips throwing up the parlour window and loudly seconding the invitation. Mrs. Phillips was always glad to see her nieces, and the two eldest, from their recent absence, were particularly welcome. Her civility was claimed towards Mr. Collins by Jane's introduction of him, she received him with her very best politeness, which he returned with as much more, apologizing for his intrusion without any previous acquaintance with her. Mrs. Phillips was quite awed by such an excess of good breeding, but her contemplation of one stranger was soon put to an end by exclamations and inquiries about the other, of whom, however, she could only tell her nieces what she already knew— that Mr. Denny had brought him from London, and that he was to have a lieutenant's commission in the regiment, which was presently engaged to the north. She had been watching him the last hour, she said, as he walked up and down the street, and had Mr. Wickham appeared, Kitty and Lydia would certainly have continued the occupation. But unluckily, no one passed windows now except a few of the officers, who, in comparison with the stranger, were become stupid, disagreeable fellows. Some of them were to dine with the Phillipses the next day, and their aunt promised to make her husband call on Mr. Wickham and give him an invitation also, if the family from Longbourn would come in the evening. This was agreed to, and Mrs. Phillips protested that they would have a little bit of hot supper and a nice, comfortable, noisy game of crypt and coffin. The prospect of such delights was very cheering, and they parted in mutual good spirits. As they walked home, Elizabeth related to Jane what she had seen pass between the two gentlemen, but though Jane would have defended either or both had they appeared to be in the wrong, she could no more explain such behaviour than her sister. Chapter 16 as no objection was made to the young people's engagement with their aunt, the coach conveyed Mr. Collins and his five cousins at a suitable hour to Meryton. As they passed the croquet grounds and the scorched acre of woods that marked Penny MacGregor's final resting place, the idle chatter that had engaged them thus far was suddenly ended, for all six could think of nothing but the news which had only that morning reached them at Longbourn. Penny's father, mad with grief, had thrown himself into a vat of boiling perfume. By the time his apprentices pulled him out, he had been badly disfigured and rendered blind. Doctors were unsure if he would survive or if the stench would ever leave him. All sat in reverent silence until they reached the outskirts of Meryton. Upon reaching their destination, Mr. Collins was at leisure to look around him and admire, and he was so much struck with the size and the furniture of the apartment that he declared he might almost have supposed himself in one of Lady Catherine's drawing rooms. Mrs. Phillips felt all the force of the compliment, being herself quite aware of Lady Catherine's proclivity for slaying the sorry stricken, which, she dare thought, exceeded that of her own nieces. In describing to her all the grandeur of Lady Catherine and her mansion, which had received considerable improvements, including a grand dojo and new quarters for her private guard of ninjas, Mr. Collins was happily employed until the gentleman joined them, and he found in Mrs. Phillips a very attentive listener, whose opinion of his consequence increased with what she heard, and who was resolving to retail it all among her neighbours as soon as she could. To the girls, who could not listen to their cousin without taking a silent inventory of the countless ways they could kill him, the interval of waiting appeared very long. It was over at last, however. The gentleman did approach, and when Mr. Wickham walked into the room, Elizabeth felt as if she had just been stunned by a devastating roundhouse kick. Such was his effect on her that those traits of her sex, despite all her training, remained susceptible to influence. The officers of the shire were in general a very creditable, gentlemanlike set, 
But Mr. Wickham was as far beyond them all in person, countenance, air, and walk, as they were superior to the broad-faced, stuffy Uncle Phillips, breathing port wine, who followed them into the room. Mr. Wickham was the happy man toward whom almost every female eye was turned, and Elizabeth was the happy woman by whom he finally seated himself, and the agreeable manner in which he immediately fell into conversation, though it was only on its being a wet night, made her feel that the commonest, dullest, most threadbare topic might be rendered interesting by the skill of the speaker. With such rivals for the notice of the fair as Mr. Wickham and the officers, Mr. Collins seemed to sink into insignificance. To the young ladies he certainly was nothing. But he had still, at intervals, a kind listener in Mrs. Phillips, and was by her watchfulness most abundantly supplied with coffee and muffin. When the card tables were placed, he had the opportunity of obliging her in turn by sitting down to crypt and coffin. Mr. Wickham did not play at crypt and coffin, and with ready delight was he received at the other table between Elizabeth and Lydia. At first there seemed danger of Lydia's engrossing him entirely, for she was a most determined talker, but being likewise extremely fond of cards, she soon grew too much interested in the game, too eager to know whether players would find their crypts eerily empty or their coffins happily full. Allowing for the common demands of the game, Mr. Wickham was therefore at leisure to talk to Elizabeth, and she was very willing to hear him, though what she chiefly wished to hear she could not hope to be told, the history of his acquaintance with Mr. Darcy. She dared not even mention that gentleman. Her curiosity, however, was unexpectedly relieved. Mr. Wickham began the subject himself. He inquired how far Netherfield was from Meryton, and after receiving her answer, asked in a hesitating manner how long Mr. Darcy had been staying there. About a month, said Elizabeth. He is a man of many kills, I understand. Yes, replied Mr. Wickham. His talent as a warrior is above reproach. You could not have met with a person more capable of giving you certain information on that head than myself, for I have been connected with his family in a particular manner from my infancy. Elizabeth could not but look surprised. You may well be surprised, Miss Bennet, at such an assertion, after seeing, as a lady of your training probably might, the very cold manner of our meeting yesterday. Are you much acquainted with Mr. Darcy? As much as I ever wished to be cried Elizabeth very warmly. I have spent four days in the same house with him, and I think him very disagreeable. I have no right to give my opinion, said Wickham, as to his being agreeable or otherwise. I am not qualified to form one. I have known him too long and too well to be a fair judge. It is impossible for me to be impartial, but I believe your opinion of him would in general astonish, and perhaps you would not express it quite so strongly anywhere else other than here in your own family. Upon my word, I say no more here than I might say in any house in the neighbourhood, except Netherfield. He is not at all liked in Hertfordshire. Everybody is disgusted with his pride. I hope your plans in favour of the Shire will not be affected by his being in the neighbourhood. Oh, no, it is not for me to be driven away by Mr. Darcy. If he wishes to avoid seeing me, he must go. We are not on friendly terms, and it always gives me pain to meet him, but I have no reason for avoiding him. We are, after all, both warriors, and it is beneath the honour of a warrior to shrink from the sight of any man. His father, Miss Bennet, the late Mr. Darcy, was one of the best zombie slayers that ever breathed, and the truest friend I ever had. And I can never be in company with this Mr. Darcy without being grieved by a thousand tender recollections. His behaviour to myself has been scandalous, but I believe I could forgive him anything rather than his disappointing the hopes and disgracing the memory of his father." Elizabeth found the interest of the subject increase, and listened with all her heart, but the delicacy of it prevented further inquiry. Mr. Wickham began to speak on more general topics, Meryton, the neighbourhood, the society, appearing highly pleased with all that he had yet seen, excluding, of course, the ever-increasing number of unmentionables, no doubt a direct consequence of Manchester's collapse.'
A military life is not what I was intended for, but circumstances have now made it unavoidable, as they have for so many who intended otherwise with their lives. The church ought to have been my profession. I was brought up for the church, and I should at this time have been in possession of a most valuable living, had it pleased the gentleman we were speaking of just now. Indeed? Yes, the late Mr. Darcy bequeathed me the next presentation of the best living in his gift. He was my godfather, and excessively attached to me. I cannot do justice to his kindness. He meant to provide for me amply, and thought he had done it. But when he was slain in the Second Battle of Kent, it was given elsewhere. Good heavens, cried Elizabeth, but how could that be? How could his will be disregarded? Why did you not seek legal redress? There was just such an informality in the terms of the bequests as to give me no hope from law. A man of honour could not have doubted the intention, but Mr. Darcy chose to doubt it, or to treat it as a merely conditional recommendation, and to assert that I had forfeited all claim to it by extravagance, imprudence, in short, anything or nothing. But the fact is that we are very different sort of men, and that he hates me. This is quite shocking. He deserves to be felled at the end of a Zatoichi cane sword. Sometime or other he will be, but it shall not be by me. Till I can forget his father, I can never expose him or challenge him to duel. Elizabeth honoured him for such feelings, and thought him handsomer than ever as he expressed them. But what? said she, after a pause, can have been his motive. What can have induced him to behave so cruelly? A thorough, determined dislike of me, a dislike which I cannot but attribute in some measure to jealousy. Had the late Mr. Darcy liked me less, his son might have borne with me better, but his father's uncommon attachment to me irritated him, I believe, very early in life. He could find no fault with me, and I dare say it drove Darcy to resent my very existence. And when his father passed, he saw his opportunity to punish me for years of perceived injustice. I had not thought Mr. Darcy so bad as this, though I have never liked him. I never suspected him of descending to such malicious revenge, such injustice, such inhumanity as this. Mr. Wickham related to Elizabeth a tale from his youth which he believed best illustrated the nature of that inhumanity. When he and Darcy were both boys of no more than seven years, the elder Darcy had taken a keen interest in their training. One day, during a daybreak spa, the young Wickham landed a severe kick which sent Darcy to the ground. The elder Darcy implored Wickham to finish his son with a blow to the throat— when the boy protested, the elder Darcy, rather than punishing him for insolence, praised his generosity of spirit. The young Darcy, embarrassed more by his father's preference than his own defeat, attacked Wickham when his back was turned, sweeping his legs with a quarterstaff and shattering the bones of both. It was nearly a year before he walked without the aid of a cane. Can such abominable pride as his have ever done him good? Yes, it has often led him to be liberal and generous, to give his money freely, to display hospitality, to assist his tenants, and to relieve the poor. He has also brotherly pride, which, from some brotherly affection, makes him a very kind and careful guardian of his sister. What sort of a girl is Miss Darcy? He shook his head. I wish I could call her amiable. It gives me pain to speak ill of a Darcy— but she is too much like her brother, very, very proud. As a child, she was affectionate and pleasing and extremely fond of me, and I have devoted hours and hours to her amusement, but she is nothing to me now. She is a handsome girl, about fifteen or sixteen, and, I understand, highly skilled in the deadly arts. Since her father's death, her home has been London, where a lady lives with her and superintends her training. After many pauses and many trials of other subjects, Elizabeth could not help reverting once more to the first, and saying, I am astonished at his intimacy with Mr. Bingley. How can Mr. Bingley, who seems good humour itself, and is, I really believe, truly amiable, be in friendship with such a man? How can they suit each other? Do you know Mr. Bingley? Not at all.
He is a sweet-tempered, amiable, charming man. He cannot know what Mr. Darcy is. Probably not, but Mr. Darcy can please where he chooses. He has much of, and I say this without meaning to offend, he has much of a woman's trickery in him. He does not want abilities. He can be a conversable companion if he thinks it worth his while. Among those who are at all his equals in consequence, he is a very different man from what he is to the less prosperous. His pride never deserts him, but with the rich he is liberal-minded, just, sincere, rational, honourable, and perhaps agreeable. I put this to you, Miss Bennet. Is he not one of His Majesty's most gifted servants? By reputation, yes. He is quite deadly. Yet have you ever seen him, fell and unmentionable? Has he ever joined you in battle? Elizabeth was silent. I have come to know this of rich men, that they rarely condescend to assist others unless there is some personal benefit in it. Mr. Darcy fights only when his own interests are threatened. He cares little for the suffering of England. The crypt and coffin party soon afterwards breaking up, the players gathered round the other table and Mr. Collins took his station between his cousin Elizabeth and Mrs. Phillips. The usual inquiries as to his success were made by the latter. It had not been very great. He had found the majority of his crypts quite full of zombies. But when Mrs. Phillips began to express her concern thereupon, he assured her with much earnest gravity that it was not of the least importance, that he considered the money as a mere trifle, and begged that she would not make herself uneasy. I know very well, madam, said he, that when persons sit down to a game of crypt and coffin, they must take their chances of these things, and happily I am not in such circumstances as to make five shillings any object. There are undoubtedly many who could not say the same, but thanks to Lady Catherine de Bourgh, I am removed far beyond the necessity of regarding little matters. Mr. Wickham's attention was caught, and after observing Mr. Collins for a few moments, he asked Elizabeth in a low voice whether her relation was very intimately acquainted with the family of de Bourgh. Lady Catherine de Bourgh, she replied, has very lately given him a living— I hardly know how Mr. Collins was first introduced to her notice, but he certainly has not known her long. You know, of course, that Lady Catherine de Bourgh and Lady Anne Darcy were sisters, consequently that she is aunt to the present Mr. Darcy. No, indeed, I did not. I knew only of Lady Catherine's claim to quieting more of Satan's servants than any woman in England. Her daughter, Miss de Bourgh, will have a very large fortune and it is believed that she and her cousin will unite the two estates. This information made Elizabeth smile as she thought of poor Miss Bingley. Vain indeed must be all her attentions. Vain and useless her affection for his sister and her praise of Mr. Darcy himself, unaware that he was already destined for another. Mr. Collins, said Elizabeth, speaks highly both of Lady Catherine and her daughter, but I suspect his gratitude misleads him, and that in spite of her being his patroness and a great warrior, she is an arrogant, conceited woman. I believe her to be both in a great degree, replied Wickham. I have not seen her for many years, but I very well remember that I never liked her, and that her manners were dictatorial and insolent. She has the reputation of being remarkably skilled, but I rather believe she derives part of her fame from her rank and fortune. Elizabeth allowed that he had given a very rational account of it, and they continued talking together with mutual satisfaction till supper put an end to cards and gave the rest of the ladies their share of Mr. Wickham's attentions. There could be no conversation in the noise of Mrs. Phillips's supper party, but his manners recommended him to everybody. Whatever he said was said well, and whatever he did done gracefully. Elizabeth went away with her head full of him, she could think of nothing but of Mr. Wickham, and of what he had told her, all the way home. But there was not time for her to even mention his name as they went, for she and her sisters could hear the groans of unmentionables echoing through the pitch-black woods on either side of the carriage. They were distant enough so as not to arouse a fear of imminent attack, but close enough to necessitate a minimum of noise." They rode in silence, the girls with their firearms resting neatly on their laps.
For once, Mr. Collins could not be persuaded to make a sound. Chapter 17 Elizabeth related to Jane the next day what had passed between Mr. Wickham and herself. Jane listened with astonishment and concern. She knew not how to believe that Mr. Darcy could be so unworthy of Mr. Bingley's regard, and yet it was not in her nature to question the veracity of a young man of such amiable appearance as Wickham. The possibility of his having his legs shattered was enough to interest all her tender feelings, and nothing remained to be done but to think well of them both— to defend the conduct of each, and throw into the account of accident or mistake whatever could not be otherwise explained. They have both, said she, been deceived in some way or other. Interested people have perhaps misrepresented each to the other. It is impossible for us to conjecture the causes which may have alienated them without actual blame on either side. Very true indeed. And now, my dear Jane— what have you got to say on behalf of the interested people who have probably been concerned in the business? Do clear them, too, or we shall be obliged to think ill of somebody. Laugh as much as you choose, but you will not laugh me out of my opinion. My dearest Lizzie, do but consider in what a disgraceful light it places Mr. Darcy to be treating his father's favourite in such a manner, one whom his father had trained in the deadly arts and promised to provide for. It is impossible. I can much more easily believe Mr. Bingley's being imposed on than that Mr. Wickham should invent such a history of himself as he gave me last night. Names, facts, everything mentioned without ceremony. If it be not so, let Mr. Darcy contradict it. Besides, there was truth in his looks. It is difficult indeed. It is distressing. One does not know what to think. I beg your pardon. One knows exactly what to think. But Jane could think with certainty on only one point, that Mr. Bingley, if he had been imposed on, would have much to suffer when the affair became public, and may even feel a duel necessary to restore his honour. She could hardly bear the thought. The two young ladies were summoned from the dojo, where this conversation passed, by the arrival of the very persons of whom they had been speaking— Mr. Bingley and his sisters came to give their personal invitation for the long-expected ball at Netherfield, which was fixed for the following Tuesday. Jane and Elizabeth were embarrassed to receive callers in their sparring gowns, but their unusual appearance did not deter the ladies from being delighted to see them, particularly their dear friend Jane. The ladies called it an age since they had met, and repeatedly asked what she had been doing with herself since their separation— to the rest of the family they paid little attention, avoiding Mrs. Bennet as much as possible, saying not much to Elizabeth and nothing at all to the others. They were soon gone again, rising from their seats with an activity which took their brother by surprise, and hurrying off as if eager to escape from Mrs. Bennet's civilities. The prospect of the Netherfield Ball was extremely agreeable to every female of the family. Mrs. Bennet chose to consider it as given in compliment to her eldest daughter, and was particularly flattered by receiving the invitation from Mr. Bingley himself, instead of a ceremonious card. Jane pictured to herself a happy evening in the society of her two friends and the attentions of their brother, and Elizabeth thought with pleasure of dancing a great deal with Mr. Wickham, and of seeing a confirmation of everything in Mr. Darcy's look and behaviour. Elizabeth's spirits were so high on this occasion that though she did not often speak unnecessarily to Mr. Collins, she could not help asking him whether he intended to accept Mr. Bingley's invitation, and if he did, whether he would think it proper to join in the evening's amusement. And she was rather surprised to find that he entertained no scruple whatever on that head, and was very far from dreading a rebuke either from the Archbishop or Lady Catherine de Bourgh by venturing to dance." I am by no means of the opinion, said he, that a ball of this kind, given by a young man of character, can have any evil tendency, and I shall hope to be honoured with the hands of all my fair cousins in the course of the evening. And I take this opportunity of soliciting yours, Miss Elizabeth, for the two first dances especially, a preference which I trust my cousin Jane will attribute to the right cause, and not to any disrespect for her. Elizabeth felt herself completely taken in. 
She had fully proposed being engaged by Mr. Wickham for those very dances, and to have Mr. Collins instead. Her liveliness had never been worse timed. There was no help for it, however. Mr. Wickham's happiness and her own were perforce delayed a little longer, and Mr. Collins's proposal accepted with as good a grace as she could. She was soon after afflicted with a most palpable urge to vomit, and politely cupped her hands lest the sight of her sick distress the present party. Thankfully, the urge subsided quickly, but the realization that invited it remained. Did this fat little priest mean to take her as a wife? She was horrified at the thought of marrying a man whose only skill with a blade was cutting slivers of gorgonzola. If there had not been a Netherfield ball to prepare for, the younger Miss Bennets would have been in a very pitiable state, for from the day of the invitation to the day of the ball there was such a succession of rain as prevented their walking to Meryton once. The earth was again soft and the dead numerous. No aunt, no officers, no news could be sought after. Even Elizabeth might have found some trial of her patience in weather which totally suspended the improvement of her acquaintance with Mr. Wickham, and nothing less than a dance on Tuesday could have made such a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday endurable to Kitty and Lydia.